Okay, good morning, everyone. Please come to order. Let's start immediately with the approval of the minutes from our public session on November 20th of this year. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Any opposed? Motion to approve the minutes is passed. Moving to Roman numeral number three, our executive director's report, Ms. Bybin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, on the staffing update, I think I referenced last meeting that we were anticipating a new auditor. That auditor has started and joined the team and is already a productive member of staff, so that's a good development. On um, the training update, the, um, we have been conducting the lobbying and ethics trainings. We've already conducted some, um, and we have additional trainings that will be scheduled in January, and we look forward to continuing those throughout the year. They've been productive so far, and we've gotten very positive feedback. I do want to mention, obviously, the upcoming filing dates, biennial registration uh, on January 1st, and client semiannual reports, which are due along with some of the new disclosure requirements, um, January 15th. So those are filing dates to remember. It's obviously a busy time for staff, and um, we are prepared for that. Okay. Thank you. Any questions regarding the executive director's report? Moving right along, regulations, Ellen? First, I just want to start with an update on the status of the source of funding regulations. You're very familiar with those. And as you recall, as amended, we've put them back out um, on two tracks, to proceed as emergency regulations and to proceed as regular uh, regulations as amended um, pursuant to the commission's last meeting. Um, pursuant to the SAPA process. So the those regulations, they're just being finalized for submission. And do you want to... Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can't, so. mute it can't mute it. They have to okay. mute it from their end. The, um, those regulations will be um, submitted for publication imminently by the end of the week, is my understanding. And for the ones that are proceeding as emergency regulations, they will be effective upon publication. So those are on track. Um, if there are no questions on that, I want to turn now to um, what's on your agenda as draft regulations. These are what I would call uh, preliminary draft regulations relating to gifts and related issues. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation on the substance of them, but before we go to the substance, I want to just, I, I want to start with our proposal. Um, these are preliminary drafts that have been developed by staff. Most of these are new. Some of these are revisions of existing regulations. I'm going to highlight all of that as we go through them. Staff's proposal to the commission is that we familiarize you today in, with the substance. You've also had some drafts to review yourselves. Um, this is an area where there has been a lot of confusion. Um, there have been different standards, uh, not, a, not enough clarity. And it's an area where we think through regulation, we, we should try to provide the clarity necessary for these very important areas. I want to emphasize that these are preliminary drafts, and our proposal is that we present these to you today, and that after today, we continue to develop them and post them on the website and solicit informal comment so that we can come back to the commission informed with comments from the regulated community, comments from the Legislative Ethics Commission, which um, also has the authority to issue guidance in this area, and I think it's very important that we be coordinated with them. So our proposal is that we run through the substance today. These are what I would call preliminary drafts developed by staff, and that we then, after you've 
after we've done the presentation today, we continue to develop them. We post them on the website, have additional dialogue with the regulated community and others, and then come back to you with a summary of those comments and with further recommendations. So that's what we're doing here today. I'm not seeking, this is really just to inform you of the substance of the drafts that we will be working with, with the understanding that these are a work in progress and that we think it's very important that we as a commission, particularly in this critical area, that we be informed by the regulated community and others. Can, can I ask, as we go through this, for you to flag uh, significant changes from current regulations? I know that would be hard to do. Where there's a, a major change in direction. I, I'm going to try. I will try to do that. I will try to do that. Um, okay. Without, if there are any any questions on that, I'd like to actually turn to the substance. My, my concern is, no, if I may. Yes. I think it's important. I think it just underscores. I think it's important that we that we be coordinated. We're all working with the regulated community, as you said, and legislative ethics continues to have authority to issue guidance um, on these topics. So I think if the goal is to provide clarity, um, the more coordinated we can be, um, the more consistent we can be, the better. Yes, thank you. My feeling is exactly. Commissioner Cavella? Yeah, my concern and, and speak up to so everyone. I'm yeah, I think here. it's uh, a super job being done by <clears throat> my concern is once you post something and then we try to change it, it's almost as if you change the law. Uh, so my concern and we, we saw that the last time. Uh, once we did something and then we changed it, we were concerned. Um, so my suggestion is that we hold off on posting until we have something coordinated. But I probably am in a minority on this one. Um, um, here's here's what I and and I think I don't know that we're saying anything different. I think it is important as I go through the substance of this. I think it's important just to provide you with the framework and to and as I said, the starting point on the substance. I think you're absolutely right that this needs to be a dialogue. It needs to be a work in progress, and we may very well want to have additional conversations before we post. So we all understand that that's, this is a process. And I do think that, that the important work of the commission in being transparent, we're, we're putting it up not to say that this is the final word. We're putting it up to actually say this is a starting point. We want to hear from the regulated community. We want to be fair and reasonable and practical. And so that's why I think this is a good starting point. But I think as with other regulations that we've done, the process by which we're informed by the regulated community and others has been a productive one. Sounds like we're all on the same page. Okay. So um, just to be clear, I just wanted to give everyone a sense of the, of the statutory framework that we're talking about. The regulations that, that ultimately that we are developing come in the context of a few key statutes. The Lobbying Act has um, prohibits registered lobbyists and their clients from giving or offering gifts to certain public officials. The Lobbying Act includes definitions of gift and contains various exclusions. The Public Officers Law, 73.5 in particular, prohibits certain state officers and employees from soliciting, accepting, or receiving gifts. And um, provisions of the Public Officers Law, 5A, B, and C, prohibit statewide elected officials and civil department heads from receiving payment for speeches. 5AC is um, specific to members of the legislature and legislative employees, um, prohibits them from receiving certain payment for speeches unless it meets certain exceptions. And then, of course, there's always Public Officers Law 74, which I'm, I may reference uh, multiple times 
um, throughout. It's not a specific gift prohibition. The others are specific on gifts, but 74 speaks generally about avoiding conflicts of interest or improper um, interested relationships so that even if something is not prohibited as a gift, it might still raise a 74 issue. You always have to keep 74 in mind. What staff has attempted to do in these drafts is develop regulations that provides clarity to the various different provisions. You see they exist in the lobbying law and in the public officer's law, um, and to provide clarity to the regulated community so that they can comply with this, so that the standards are as consistent as possible. <clears throat> so um, what you have and what we are developing falls into the following categories. For gifts, um, parts 933 and 934, and Commissioner Balgar, this is, this is hopefully answer some of your question. Um, there were no existing regulations. These are new. So this is not, this is, all of it in some respects are new. Um, and it is an effort to govern the receipt of gifts by state officers, employees, and the giving of gifts by registered lobbyists. And in particular, and I'll mention this as we get more specific, um, to make clear that certain of the concepts in the lobbying law, the definition of gifts, some of the definition of the exclusions, to make clear that that applies as well to the public officer's law analysis. And that's an important clarity that has been done in the past through advisory opinions and other mechanisms, but we think through the regulation is the clearest way of providing that guidance. Um, part 930 re refers to honoraria. Um, there is, there are existing regs on this which cover um, both honoraria and official activity expense payment and service payment, although those are new terms. They weren't called that previously. Um, the new um, draft that we're developing, we've separated those out to make those concepts clearer. Um, so the first 930 will cover honoraria alone. Um, the next part, 931, you see we've now termed that official activity expense payment and service payment. Those um, were concepts that existed previously in regulatory form. Um, they were referred to as travel payment and as payment in lieu of honoraria. We thought, and, and I think the practice has shown, those were confusing concepts. It was hard to, um, hard to comply with. And what we've attempted to do in these drafts is to provide a practical, um, easy to understand um, mechanism for complying with the regulations or the requirements with respect to the um, receiving payment or reimbursement related to official travel and receiving um, um, payment for services provided related to that. Finally, in Part 939, that addresses public service announcements. That is an area where there have not been any previous regulations. And as you know, Executive Law 949D1 specifically mandated the Commission to adopt regulations defining the permissible use of public service announcements. So that is also included in, um, in this um, in this uh, in the regulations that we've developed, we'll go into detail with each one of those in a minute. All right, I'm going to turn to the draft of the 933, which is gift regulations for state officers and employees. Quite simply, the regulations determine whether and under what circumstances state officers or employees may receive gifts and it includes a definition of state officers and employees to include those listed above, generally statewide electeds, officers and employees of, of statewide elected officials, heads of state agencies, officers and employees of state agencies, members or directors of public authorities, and legislative members and legislative employees. Gifts, as I mentioned, are, are defined in the statute as generally any item or service of more than nominal value, including discounts. Nominal value has been a tricky concept in the past, hard to know what it is, 
And under the regs, one of the things we do in the draft is propose that nominal value be defined as anything is five, worth, valued at $5 or less. Um, when you look at other, some states, not all states, but, but, but many states do ascribe a value to nominal. And of those states that do ascribe a value, five is among, is, is the lowest. There are, you know, some states pick it at 25, 20, 15. That's a stick of bubble gum today. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's a cup of coffee, really, in some instances, <laughs> although there's different exclusions to address that. But so that's one that's one that's one key addition, which is defining giving a, a dollar value to nominal, which we think um, will help um, will help provide the clarity that 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 is the goal here. Um, it goes on to define certain things as non gifts, which are anything for which the state has paid or secured by state contract, rewards or prizes given to competitors in contests or events, including random drawings that are open to the public and public services announcements as, de as defined later in our regulations. So if they're not a gift, it's not subject to this analysis. The regulations provide essentially a three-step analysis to determine whether or not a gift is permissible. First, it, it's the question of is the item a gift? That's a determination, as I said. Is it more than nominal value or is it, is it a non-gift? Um, if it's more than nominal value and not a non-gift, then you go to the next step. If the item is a gift, does it fall into one of the exclusions, which I'm about to go through? And then if the item does not fall into one of the exclusions, then you need to conduct an appropriate gift analysis. That's essentially the, the framework of the proposed uh, draft regulations. Um, so here are some of the... Here are some of the exclusions. I mentioned before, part of the analysis is, does it fall within um, one of the exclusions? And as I mentioned at the outset, these are exclusions that exist in the lobbying law, and we're making it clear that it applies in the public officer's law context, which we think is, is as I said, kind of an appropriate way of bringing this all together or creating consistent standards that everyone can comply with. Here are some of the exclusions. Food or beverage valued at $15 or less. These are statutory. Um, um, complimentary attendance, including food and beverage at a bona fide charitable event or bona fide political event. Complimentary attendance at a widely attended event, awards, plaques, and other ceremonial items, honorary degrees, promotional items, goods and services, and discounts for goods and services. Uh, personal gifts, it's certain goods and services and certain discounts for goods and services, I should say. Customary and special occasion gifts, reimbursement for expenses for speakers at informational events, provision of local transportation to inspect facilities relating to your official duties, and meals for, partici for participants at a professional or educational program. Many of these are terms that are further defined, but broadly speaking, these are the exclusions in the lobbying law. The regulations make it clear that they apply in the public officer's law context. I should mention that the food or beverage valued at $15 or less and the complimentary attendance at a widely attended event those are concepts that were um, added by um, PIRA. I think they also pay for rooms things if you're lecturing like at one of the judicial seminars and so on. Yeah, we're gonna, that's the official activity expense that we'll get to. Okay, because I saw meals for participants. But I don't want to. Right, I think it's a different analysis. These are the exclusions. No. If the gift does not meet any of those exclusions that are um, identified, and then, then the next question is, um, who is the source of the gift? And this is a concept that, um, that some of the regulated um, uh, community may have been familiar with in some of the prior precedent in, in the predecessor ethics agencies. Um, COPE issued an opinion, 0801, which many are familiar with, which talked about disqualified sources and listed disqualified sources and essentially said that, that a gift from a disqualified source is prohibited per se. And Commissioner Bulgaro, this is an area, again, where the, the draft regulation uh, creates a significant departure from that. 
where it embraces the Disqual the definition of disqualified sources. We now call them interested sources. It is not a per se prohibition. It goes back to the statute really talks more about a, a, a kind of rebuttable presumption, and the regulations go back to that type of analysis. But it does embrace the interested source. And these identified here are, are described as interested sources. So if you meet any one of these categories, you're deemed to be an interested source, and then that will then determine the analysis that you do. Ellen, before yes. you leave, uh, could you give an example of number three under interested source? That's someone who engages in lobbying, but maybe not in excess of 5,000. So um, they, they're not required to be listed on a registration, but they may, in fact, lobby. Is there yeah, another example of that? Anyone? Okay. Um, but as you see, the interested sources are generally someone who has some dealings with the state or is engaged in lobbying or, or perhaps has some interest that relates to the state officer or their agency. If the gift is from an interested source, then the gift is prohibited unless, one, it is not reasonable to infer that the gift was intended to influence the state officer or employee in the performance of his or her duties. It could not reasonably be inferred that the gift was expected to influence the state officer employment or employee in the performance of his or her official duties. And it is not reasonable to infer that the gift was intended as a reward for any official action on his or her part. So this, again, is going back to more of a rebuttable presumption um, and not a per se prohibition. If you meet those three requirements, then the gift, um, the gift is presumed prohibited unless you meet those three requirements. If the gift is not from an interested source, if you don't fall into any of those categories that are listed, then the gift is permissible unless it is offered or given under circumstances in which it could reasonably be inferred that the gift was intended to influence the state officer employee in the performance of his or her official duties or was intended as a reward for an official action on his or her part. So you see there's a shift depending on the source. This is a, a new concept that we think is, um, and this is a good example of, we think it's both flows from the statute uh, 73.5 prohibition as well as the section 74 principles. Um, and that's essentially that a gift that is otherwise per permissible may become prohibited if it is one of a series of gifts from the same person or entity. Such gifts could create a reasonable basis for the impression that the gift was intended to influence or reward the state officer employee in connection with the performance of his or her official duties. So you can do the analysis for one gift, but that doesn't necessarily apply if it's multiple gifts from the same source. <clears throat> so that, I've just gone over, those are the um, draft regulations for the state officers and employees and related. These are now the gift regulations for lobbyists and clients of lobbyists are very similar. They're in Part 934. Um, essentially, it's the same analysis as what I've just described. However, um, because they are the lobbyists and clients of lobbyists, you don't do the interested source analysis because they are the interested or potentially the interested source. Um, the, the gift regulations in 934 determine whether and under what circumstances lobbyists or clients of lobbyists may offer gifts to public officials. Public <coughs> officials include state officers or employees as defined in Part 933 and um, also include some municipal officers. So that's a, an expanded definition of, of who's a public officer. It includes definition of gifts and nominal value <coughs> consistent with the ones that I've gone over in 933, which again, that's a key goal, is to provide consistent standards on both sides. And, the, and, and similarly, the exclusions for gifts 
are also the same as I've mentioned in the in the draft of 933. Okay, 930. As I mentioned, there there were previously existing regulations for honoraria. We've made some significant changes, including breaking them out. So 930 now only the draft only applies to honoraria. The definition of honorarium is any payment to a state officer or employee for a service performed that is not a part of his or her official duties. The typical forms of this are payment for delivering a speech, writing or publishing an article, or participating in a conference or a similar event. This is a related concept to a gift, but because it's not a gift, because it's an exchange for service, it's addressed under the honorarium um, um, uh, regulations. For state officers and employees other than legislative members and employees, the draft regulations propose um, clear procedures for approval. The request for approval would be submitted to the approving authority. The approving authority determines if the request meets the conditions for approval pursuant to the draft regulations, which I'll go over with you. And with respect to legislative members and legislative employees, again, our working draft, which is preliminary, um, because there's no approving authority, it suggests a mechanism where the acceptance is subject to the same conditions as state officers employees, but doesn't go through a, a, a procedure with an approving authority. The, the draft regulations um, provide that the conditions for acceptance of honoraria um, must meet certain requirements, that there no state resources or work time will be used to perform the services or to pay for expenses related to the service for which the honorarium is offered. An honorarium from an interested source may not be accepted unless it is offered under circumstances in which it could not be reasonably inferred that the honorarium is intended to influence or reward the recipient. That's just tracking the same concept that we have in the gift analysis. The offeror is not being used to conceal that the honorarium is actually offered by an, an interested source. And the service for which the honorarium is offered and acceptance of the honorarium do not violate, otherwise violate public officer's law 74. Those are the conditions that the approving authority would be considering in whether or not to um, approve the acceptance of honorarium. Um, <clears throat> the, this is a, under the 73.5, certain persons are prohibited from receiving payment for speeches, and um, that statewide elected officials and heads of civil department cannot solicit, accept, or receive any payment for a speech. And um, 73.5A, B, C, yeah, these are B and C. Um, this is C, for legislative members and employees cannot solicit, accept, or receive payment for a speech unless the speech is uh, unrelated to the individual's current public employment or in connection with the practice of a bona fide business trade or profession. That, again, is statutory, but the regulations provide some clarity on those. <clears throat> Following individuals are exempt from the limitations on the receipt of honoraria, provided that the service performed is within the subject matter of their official academic or research discipline. Um, that's faculty members of SUNY and CUNY, and other state officers or employees with titles of research scientist, cancer research scientist, research physician, research psych psychiatrist, and psychiatrist. <clears throat> State officers and employees shall report an honorarium in excess of $1,000 in their financial disclosure statement, and honoraria from the same offeror are aggregated to determine if that threshold is met. <clears throat> All right, the new draft 931 is, whoops, I'm sorry. 931 is, uh, is, a, is a concept that was regulated previously, but the, these are new. We've broken them out, and we have, um, we have renamed them in a way that we think is easier to understand. And these are the regulations governing official activity expense payments and service payments. And Commissioner Cavello, I think these are the areas that you may have been referencing. Um, part 931 provides a framework for analyzing if it's permissible for a state officer or employee 
to accept any payment or reimbursement for costs associated with an official activity. So if you're invited to go to a conference or something along those lines that's related to your official duties, can you get the travel expense payment or reimbursement? Um, the regulations define certain of these uh, concepts. Official activity is attendance or service at an event that is part of an individual's official duties and benefits the individual's state agency. At official activity expense payment is the payment or reimbursement for the cost of attendance, registration, travel, food, or lodging related to the official activity. And service payment is payment of money in consideration for an action or service performed in connection with the official activity. And for that, that's separate. It's not a travel payment. It's not a lodging payment. That's if, if they're offering some payment for your delivering the speech while you're there or for your conducting a workshop while you're there. That's a service payment. And as you'll see in a minute, Service payment does not go to the individual. It, once it's de deemed acceptable, it goes to the general fund. Um, the regulations provide, similar to the honorarium, a mechanism for seeking approval for state officers and employees other than the legislative members and employees. They must seek approval. Um, they must seek approval with their appointing authority um, to accept the official activity expense payment. The approving authority will determine if the request meets the conditions that are set in the regulations. And um, the approving authority at the same time determines, based on the same conditions provided in the regulations, if any service can payment can be accepted. Again, if it can be accepted, if it meets those conditions, that money goes to the general fund, not to the individual. <coughs> These are these concepts, as I mentioned at the outset, used to be referred to as travel and payment in lieu of payment in lieu of honoraria. We thought those were confusing. Our, our general practice has been that people have been confused by those terms. We think these are easier concepts to understand. The draft regulations provide these with conditions for the whether or not they'll be acceptable. Payment or reimbursement covers only the period of time that is reasonably required to be present. Payment or reimbursement is not offered by an interested source unless it is offered under circumstances in which it could not be reasonably inferred that the reimbursement or payment is intended to influence or reward the recipient. And the offerer is not being used to conceal that the payment or reimbursement is actually offered by an interested source. Payment or reimbursement is at customary rates and could be paid otherwise under the state agency's travel policy and the official activity and corresponding payment do not otherwise violate Public Officers Law 74. All state officers and employees shall report official activity expense payments received as reimbursements in excess of 1,000 in their financial disclosure statements as well. Um, okay, that has gotten us through um, the official activity and service payments. Ellen, before we... Yes. In terms of the payment that ends up to the state, yes. is, the, uh, is it statutory that it goes to the general fund? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. statutory. It doesn't cover agencies that might be special revenue funds, operating like special revenue funds? <coughs> it actually may not be statutory. It may not be statutory. Just, it may just you know, be. Pat, <coughs> it's not. It's not. It's I mean, let, it let me say this. I'm sorry. Just give me one second. It's not statutory, but it was. It is a concept or principle that has existed previously in the prior regulations. That the concept being, the policy being, you're being paid to perform what we've already described is related to your official duty. So you shouldn't be paid again for it. Oh, no, I'm not. That's oh. not my point. But my point is, there are agencies that run on special revenue funds. So I'm wondering, you know, Do the regs people. address those, Shari? Actual, actually, the existing regulation does cover that circumstance, okay. and we intend for the so post regulation to, to refer to the same type of. Um, okay, so the general fund is just a, a catch all phrase. It would go back to whatever source that the uh, agency. If it's a, you're saying if it's an authority or something. Well, so, you know, or the uh, Financial Services Bureau, it's insurance <coughs> and banking. And all, right. Your, your question is whether all. Uh, activities, regardless of under treated yeah. the same. Yes. Okay. Right. I think there. I haven't gone into okay. the details on that, but I think you're 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 right. Which is, 
we're using general fund as a proxy yeah, okay, for it. it won't go to the individual. It'll yeah. go yeah. to the uh, to the appropriate authority, okay. whether it's the general fund or the specific okay. authority. <clears throat> but that again is not a new. That's not new. That's that's consistent yes. with the prior guidance. All right. Part 939, as I mentioned at the outset, this is new. There were not um, pre-existing regulations on this. This is, uh, there's a specific mandate in Executive Law 94 for the agency to promulgate regulations on public service announcements. Um, the issue is, before I go into the specific requirements, when is um, an appearance in, a, in, a, in an announcement, or public service announcement, when is it a legitimate public service announcement? Or um, if it's not a legitimate public service announcement, is it a gift? And that's been some of the area of confusion in the past. So um, if it meets the requirements in ultimately whatever regulation the agency, the commission proposes on public service announcements, it will be providing that clarity, which is if you meet the conditions set forth in the regulations, it will be deemed a legitimate public service announcement and therefore not a gift to the uh, public official or the state officer employee who might appear in that public service announcement. If it doesn't meet those requirements, then it may very well be considered a gift or something else. It's just a different analysis. So that's what these draft regulations are attempting to clarify. So um, the, the regulations essentially say an announcement that features a state entity or state person or a candidate will be considered a public service announcement and not a gift if it meets all of the following applicable requirements. Promotes, educates, or imparts information about a service, institution, issue, or cause generally regarded as serving the public interest. It's of primary interest to the general public or a segment of the general public and is not targeted to a specific group, a specific voters or group of voters. <coughs> it is sponsored or paid for by an organization other than a state entity which has a mission or history which includes providing outreach and information to the community. It is subject to the public service announcement policies, if any, of the entity broadcasting or otherwise distributing the announcement. And the announcement does not feature a branded product or service. It is not paid for, controlled by, or coordinated with any organization affiliated with a political party or a candidate. It does not constitute lobbying or lobbying activities. It is not a communication which promotes or supports a candidate for an office or attacks or opposes a candidate for that office and could not reasonably be inferred to have any meaning other than an exhortation to vote for or against a specific candidate. In the case of an announcement that features a state person or state entity, that announcement must further the state person's official duties or the state entity's mission. And in the case of an announcement that features a candidate, the announcement must not be aired 60 days prior to a general primary or special election in which the candidate is on the ballot, except in the case of a state or national emergency where the announcement relates to such emergency. <clears throat> I want to mention that um, particularly with the public service announcements, there was no prior precedent. Um, we've tried to be informed by there are some um, applicable or analogous federal precedents. Um, this is, of all of them, I think, you know, the area that, that will be the most evolving, where we will be seeking, you know, guidance and, and information because it is a new concept. Um, but I think, you know, the policy is clear, which is if it's a public service announcement that is truly in the public interest, I think the policy is to allow those kinds of things um, to be given um, for, for state person or entity to appear in those without it being deemed an impermissible gift, um, but um, coming up with the right standards so that we can clarify when is it something that's truly in the public interest and when is it something else. So, so thinking back to um, uh, an issue that was most controversial several years, a number of years ago, the 
uh, use of public officials in the I Love New York. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, that's, right. that's a different law. That wouldn't be covered by this? That wouldn't because those are sponsored by the state. That's state uh, funds. Okay. And there's actually right. a specific Fair statutory enough. reference for that. Um, what these are are when it's not state funds. These are not state resources. These are can, can someone else, can right. an industry, can someone else sponsor a public service announcement that features a state officer or official. And I do think there's there have been issues in the past that have come up. So public office law 73-B actually addresses when it, it, state funds being used in this situation. Okay. And in that it's case, are, are the conditions different? different. It's a different it's analysis because different. it's all statutory. Okay. okay. If some corporation, some private corporation wanted to support a candidate and run a commercial for them, uh, they couldn't do so within 60 days? The, well, it depends on what you're, you're looking to do. If you're looking to do to support a candidate, that's separate. That's that's you know it may be deemed a gift, it may be deemed a camp a campaign contribution. They can do what they want. We don't regulate that. Um, if though you're trying to do it in a way that's not about supporting the candidate, but that is promoting a public interest issue, um, buckle up for safety or something along those lines. There are if you meet certain conditions that ultimately the commission will come up with, then there are instances where that will be deemed not a gift. Um, but again, to be clear, whether or not it, it's a, it meets one of the other areas that we don't regulate is not the subject for us. We're just we're addressing the small piece of it, which is, is it an impermissible gift or is it not? <coughs> And let me, let me also just also be clear. We don't regulate corporations generally unless they're regulated in the context of lobbying. So the issue is the candidate. The issue is if you're a candidate who also happens to be a public officer and subject to the public officer's law, that's that's the issue of whether or not you can accept it. It's really not regulating the corporation's conduct. It's regulating whether or not you can appear in that, whether or not you can accept that. Um, that completes um, the presentation of these drafts. As I said at the outset, and I want to emphasize again, these are preliminary drafts. We see these as um, uh, works in progress, and um, with, um, with this presentation, we would like to continue to develop these. We'd like to have additional dialogues with with Legislative Ethics Commission and the regulated community. Um, ultimately, we'd like to post drafts on the website so that we can solic solicit additional public comment. And then we'd like to come back to the commission with proposals and recommendations informed by all of that. Any thoughts, comments? Okay. A lot of work went into this. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Excellent job. So do we need a motion to authorize? I don't think so. No. no. So we'll post them on the website, clearly delineating them as drafts. We'll invite and solicit comment, and at the, hopefully at the next meeting we'll come back. You'll inform us of the comments, summarize the comments, and we'll be able to uh, deliberate over those comments. And of, and, of course, then, just to be clear, we would then anticipate a full SAPA process after that. Yes. Okay, excellent. Nicely done, staff. Moving along to Roman numeral five, the FDS random review guidelines. Um, the uh, statute requires, correct? Right, that's right. In, attach <coughs> in attachment G, um, what you see are the FDS random review guidelines. The wind is there anything we can do about that? I think it's surf. coming at Al. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, you have some background noise there? Um, so the statute 94 does require that the um, commission develop a guidelines for a random review of the financial disclosure statements. <clears throat> Kitty K. Chan and her staff have done an excellent job in developing these. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <Alan's out>. um, <coughs> the guidelines 
provide for clear protocols in reviewing the financial disclosure statements in a manner by which the selection of the financial disclosure statements that will be reviewed, the selection is done in a manner where staff will not know the identity of the filer. So that's the ran that's one of the key points here is the randomness that the selection will be done in a random manner. S staff will not know who the filer is once they're selected. Obviously, then once they're selected, they will be submitted to um, a review. And um, the guidelines also delineate what will be entailed in that review. As you see, it's a it's a it's a fairly substantial review that will include comparison to internal documents. And um, and to public information, um, so the the the, pro the guidelines, which are clear protocols, which are in G, um, are thoughtful, very complete, and um, and we recommend that they be approved, ratified the com uh, by the commission as the guidelines that we will be using um, to conduct the random reviews. Question: If if staff um, concludes that a uh, an enforcement <clears throat> campaign of one kind or another is required or uh, or an inquiry needs mm -hmm. uh, to, to measure compliance needs to occur would the random guidelines allow yeah uh, for although that kind of targeting? the random guidelines the random guidelines first say you've got to pick them randomly and we have a system to make to ensure the randomness once you have it then they do a review and that review, if that review turns up information or um, or inconsistencies that require further inquiry, then that audit has steps for that. It takes it, it will then it, it takes a few steps to actually trigger enforcement, but there are clear steps and clear protocols for staff to follow at each of those lines. So you can stratify under these guidelines. Um, uh, lobbyists or organizations that meet a certain uh, uh, profile. These are financial disclosure statements. Oh, so I'm these, sorry, these. I'm sorry. I mean, okay, you're, yes. you're right to raise because it is analogous to the review that's done on the other side for lobbyists, and that's exactly I think the policy behind this, which is we already do random reviews, random audits of the lobbying filings. This is to create a program, an analogous program on the financial disclosure statement side. So these are these are all filers on financial disclosure statements. Pat, Pat's raising a good point on you know, related to financial disclosure because I think the form changes next year. Mm -hmm. Right. And for pretty much the last uh, 25 years, 87 or thereabouts, the form has been in statute the same. Yeah. And so what? where Pat's going it, Is the concern notice because the protocols, if you go through them, you'll see there's multiple levels of notice to the filer. So if there's a question raised, then, then the protocol requires that you give notice to the filer, give the filer an opportunity to explain or to cure or to amend. That happens two or three different times in the protocol. So there's, even if it's a new form and there's concerns because there might be questions or concerns about a new form, there's ample opportunity for the filer to have notice and an opportunity to cure. Well, not only the filer, but I think what also where Pat was going on the other side was that if we see a consistency where somebody, you know, a group of people are making the same error, that it would behoove us to get out ahead of it to the extent we can, even though the forms may be in house and say, people, you know, go mm -hmm. back and take a look at this. This is what it really Well, means. that's a great point. That's a great point, and it's precisely why um, having someone like Kitty K. Chan in charge of that group is a good idea because she's she has created systems so that she can identify those kinds of patterns and that we're doing a better job of using the data that we're collecting to, to try to inform the training and guidance. Well, I'm trying to get more to the educational as opposed to the enforcement Yes. Side. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Is there anything in the random selection uh, in terms of targets by numbers or categories? Yeah, my my understanding is, and if you look at if you look at the protocol, the protocol requires that the FDSs be numbered from one to wherever they are, they go. You know, one to twenty five thousand, 
And then the random selection is um, you use either a computer program or a third party, sometimes we use a third party, to then just give you a random selection of numbers between 1 and 25,000. And that's how you determine which filings will be, will be reviewed. But what goes into the program that makes that selection? N nothing. All you say to the you say to the program, we well, give us a well, hundred numbers, give us two hundred numbers. We're going to pick a number at the start of the year based on the number of filings that were received. That were received, we will pick, let's say, a hundred or a thousand, some percentage, and we will then say, either to the computer program or the third party, give us three hundred numbers between one and twenty-five thousand. Is there something going to be, you know, although it's uh, GAGIS relates to auditing and this is more of a review. Uh, right. right. Uh, is, are you going to be going back to GAGIS to, uh, to implement some of these ideas? Uh, this is more yeah, for yeah. database we are using, but I, was, I, I would say that in this commission we always have some flexibility on, because in reality you are also looking at, let's say, the properties. Right, like the property search. Does this person own actually three different houses instead of the one that he disclosed? And in that sense, um, a principle, um, general accounting principle, do not apply to those um, those checking. So I would say that we actually are more comprehensive than just focus on if I say that we are just bonding only following the the general accounting principle. I'm thinking more of auditing standards, but uh, oh, I, I see where you're going. Yeah, and also we do not have this. Uh, for this particular exercise, we, like what you said earlier, do we want we want to educate the individual. If we find something wrong, we want to say, okay, um, do this, giving them opportunity to change. So in that sense, um, we don't actually ask for subpoena for a particular statement. So. Then, which means the accounting principle um, only give us a certain limit. Even we apply for that, we only have limited amount of documents. Validation. Anything further? A motion. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a motion on the floor to ratify the uh, financial disclosure statement random review guidelines? Commissioner Renzi, is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Motions carried unanimously. Did you get the Skype? Yeah, okay. I think so. I said any opposed? Okay. New and other business? Okay. Is there a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to Executive Law 9419B to discuss investigative and personnel and litigation matters? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we are moving into executive session.
Can I'm I? out of here. Are you ready? I was. Four o'clock. It's meeting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we are back in public session now under Roman numeral eight of our public agenda. There is no action that was taken in the executive session. That must be reported out in public session. Moving on to Roman numeral nine. Is there a motion to adjourn this public meeting? So moved. <laughs> is there a second? Second. All in favor? I got it. Any opposed? Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.